week. So this is part of, of my, my virtual tour. And my wife is a Husky. So she is a graduate <laughs> of the master's program in marriage and family uh, therapy. And so um, I used to drive up on weekends to hang out with her in DeKalb. And so we spent a lot of time there. And so really, really glad to connect with the NIU family. And so I want to just kind of jump in. I understand the plan is for me to, to share some things with you for about 35, 40 minutes or so, um, and then get into conversation, which I'm really looking forward to. And so I've heard that the book, Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving, Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow. Um, and I'm really excited about it because this is a book that kind of shows us what happens. And I know you'll appreciate this being with the Center for Nonprofit NGO Studies. What happens when we take philanthropy and put it at the center of analysis? And we use that to pursue questions and as an analytical lens for engaging questions important to us. And so I thought I knew Madam Walker. I learned about her as a child in my church, and I thought I knew everything there was about her. But when I put philanthropy front and center and then re-engaged her life, a whole new world opened up with some important insights for this thing we call philanthropy that we're so dedicated to studying. So I want to just kind of jump right in and talk to you about why I wrote the book. And so uh, first, I'm the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of Black Baptist preachers and first ladies. So I grew up in a very generous family. I grew up in a generous church community. Um, and, and the Black church is foundational and fundamental to African-American philanthropy. And so not only were my parents uh, wonderful and, and took great care of me, but I was in a, an entire community of adults who poured themselves into me. And so I am literally an example of this great tradition and heritage of African-American philanthropy. And so, so I grew up in it, I was steeped in it, and I knew it exists. And yet, fast forward into my young adult career, I'm working as a professional fundraiser, and very frequently I'm the only African-American in the room or one of only a few. And it was really puzzling to me that this professional world of fundraising didn't seem to appreciate or value the fact that Black people give too. Uh, and fast forward my career later, when I enter into the academy, and I was working on my PhD in philanthropy, I'm reading all the literature, and I'm reading the theories, and also I'm, I'm not seeing meaningful and substantive and, and consistent engagement with the simple idea that Black people give too. There's a whole lot of literature on white people giving to black people, right? But I was looking for well, what were they doing? What was going on with them? And so, so I wrote this book to bridge that gap, the gap between what I knew existed because I had come out of it, um, but that I wasn't seeing in these professional spaces that were supposed to be dedicated to philanthropy. And so when I call it Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving, what I'm doing is I'm articulating her philosophy of philanthropy. You see, Madam Walker did not sit down and write an essay about her philosophy of philanthropy, much in the way that Andrew Carnegie did. No, her life is her living essay. Her life is her text. And so I had to dig into her archives and follow the trails and piece together her approach to philanthropy. And some really, really interesting things came as I was able to do that. And so her gospel of giving explains why she gave. It explains how she gave. It explains what she gave. And also it explains the context in which she gave. And that, my friends, I think is very important because I believe this larger moment of racial reckoning that we are all in is all about trying to force us to understand context. Now, we may all be in the country together, but we're having different experiences and we need to understand those contexts. And so I want to dig in and share with you a little bit about the context in which Madam Walker was given. In 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois, the great scholar and thinker, said this, Few races are more instinctively philanthropic than the Negro. It is shown in everyday life and in their group history. Some few of their larger philanthropies in America in early days have been recorded. Now, again, W.E.B. Du Bois is arguably one of the greatest minds produced by America, a master of multiple disciplines, and he writes this in 1909. He's no casual observer. His PhD is from Harvard. He's a leading scientist. He wrote this in a national study of Black philanthropy that he published in 1909. But get this, this was not the first study he did on that topic. It was the second. The first one was done in 1898. So in 1898, 1909, Black philanthropy is enough of a thing for this scholar to conduct two national studies about it. Think about 1898. What was going on then? We're three decades away from emancipation. Right? We're two decades away from Reconstruction, where, with the failure of Reconstruction, where citizenship was extended to African Americans and then pulled out from underneath them. 
And we're just two years away from the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision, which codified Jim Crow as the law of the land. And it's in this environment that he says, few races are more instinctively philanthropic than the Negro. Well, what's this context? Well, Du Bois knew about the Free African Society that was started in, 18, in 1787 by African Americans in Philadelphia. It was a mutual aid organization that provided education and social services. And my friends, just today, just as in today, uh, black and brown people are amongst the essential workers that are helping us fight COVID. The Free African Society was on the front lines of Philadelphia's yellow fever outbreak in 1793, saving all lives across the city of Philadelphia. Du Bois knew about people like James Fortin, who was a wealthy black sailmaker uh, in the 1700s, who reportedly had white people working for him. He became an abolitionist, funded abolitionist newspapers, and was a very vocal supporter and important person in that movement. And then this one really, really, really boggled my mind when I saw this one. In 1847, enslaved black people through a church in Richmond, Virginia, donated money across the Atlantic to help Irish people suffering under the potato famine. We're talking about a heritage of generosity here that we just, we ignore, we don't see, we don't understand, right? And then, then there's Ida B. Wells, which gives us access to another aspect of the heritage of African-American philanthropy, the idea that your voice can be a gift. That Ida B. Wells, as a journalist and an activist, used her pen and her voice to raise and force the Americans' attention onto the scourge of lynchings. In fact, the reason why we know so much about the lynchings that occurred is because she meticulously documented as many Black lives as she could find that were taken away uh, through that vicious form of terrorism, right? So this is that context that Madam Walker uh, comes out of. It existed before her, right? And it's part of what she becomes a part of. And so let's dig a little bit into her story. She was born Sarah Breedlove in 1867 in Delta, Louisiana. All of her family members had been enslaved on this plantation. She's the first freeborn person. So you can imagine the hope and excitement her parents might have had for at her birth. But life quickly became very difficult. By age of seven, she's orphaned because her parents have passed away. Um, she becomes a child laborer and a washerwoman trying to take care of herself under the, under the care and tutelage of her older sister and brother-in-law. She gets married in her early teens. She has a child, but then life strikes another, strikes another cruel blow. Her husband dies mysteriously and now she's a widowed single mother. Of course, she's uneducated. There are no provisions for black education in her, her area. And she's a homeless migrant. She's moving around the South seeking opportunity. And all around her, Jim Crow is emerging. And these racist and sexist structures are making life intentionally difficult. So she's a Black woman in this context, already leading a difficult life. And all of this happens before she's even 22. But the story begins to take a turn, and I, I won't be able to go into all depths in it, but it's in the book, and you probably have some sense of it if you've read about her or know more about her. But she makes her way up to St. Louis, where she is embraced by a local community that's anchored by the St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. And in this church, there are a whole bunch of programs that are helping arriving migrants get their lives together and get settled. And so, um, again, fast forward, we're going to accelerate through her story a little bit, but um, she begins to sell products eventually, and she does it under the name of Madam C.J. Walker, the, the name of her third husband, Charles Joseph Walker. Um, she starts a company and incorporates it in Indianapolis in 1911. It takes off, becomes wildly successful. She's in all the kinds of newspapers you can imagine. She has an incredible marketing prowess and, and genius all her own. And her story culminates on her deathbed in 1919 in her 34-room, $250,000 mansion, where Mr. John D. Rockefeller is a nearby neighbor. My friends, that is not supposed to happen in Jim Crow America. That is not Jim Crow's plan for Black life, and let, yet she accomplishes it. And she doesn't do it by herself, right? Generosity, I discovered, is a key part, an essential part of this story. So let me show you how I, how I arrived there. I jumped into the archives. I was very fortunate because I lived in Indianapolis. Madam Walker's papers are at the Indiana Historical Society. Um, over 200 boxes, 40,000 items. Now, they're all digitized now, so any one of you can go look at the same letters and receipts that I looked at, but I had to go through by hand. So it was a different experience for me, right? But there were incredible things going on there, but I couldn't quite make sense of what I was seeing because the research literature wasn't really articulating a way of seeing and understanding Madam Walker. And so, 
Uh, when I went to the history of American philanthropy, I went looking for Madam Walker and she wasn't there. This history privileges the elite white businessmen who started foundations and really upended our notion of philanthropy and who are still consequential to this day. Uh, so that was no help. And so I said, well, if American philanthropy literature is not helpful, surely the literature on women's philanthropy will be helpful. But guess what, my friends? I look for Madam Walker, she's not there. This literature privileges the wives of the elite, rich, white businessmen who started foundations and upended modern notions of philanthropy. And those, that literature is important because it gives us a gendered analysis. We, the women were doing something very different than the men's in their lives, so we have to give them their due. But again, it's focused on, on white women who are living a very different life in a very different context. Forgiving that doesn't shed any light on Madam C.J. Walker. So, well, surely African-American philanthropy is going to come through and save the day. But guess what, my friends? Madam Walker was not there. This literature tends to focus on the collective over the individual. It focuses on institutions like the Black church and, and fraternal orders and, and, and sororities and service clubs. Rarely does it really bring out a focus on, on an individual, but it has some of those traditions and some of this heritage there where I really found the anchors that would make sense for understanding Madam C.J. Walker was in Black women's history. My friends, Black women's historians have produced an incredible historiography over the past 50 years. If you're not familiar with it, I beg you to get involved with it. They're writing about church women and club women and educators and activists across the entire American experience. It's not a new phenomenon. It goes back to the very foundations of our society. And these women, by definition, are philanthropic. That was the key to unlocking Madam Walker's gospel of giving. And let me take you into the exact moment where I began to piece it together. In 1914, Madam C.J. Walker is corresponding with Booker T. Washington, the principal of Tuskegee Institute, right? And at this time, he is the guy. He's the leading Black leader, right? And not every Black American is excited about that. He's very controversial, right? But he's the guy. He has the ear of the politicians. He has the ear of the philanthropic power brokers. Madam Walker revered him. She respected his up from slavery narrative and she saw her own life as having an upward trend. She really wanted to support Tuskegee. She valued what he was doing there. So she's corresponding with him about making, get this, I know there are students in the audience, a $300 gift. And that $300, my friends, would have supported five students and still have $50 left over for the general fund. Wow, I don't want to call those the good old days, but geez, right? The money doesn't go that far these days now, does it? Right? So she's talking to him about this gift and, and had an understanding that that would be fine and would have an impact. Well, Washington contacts her back and basically says, that's nice, but can you do more? Right? Now, now why did he say that to Madam Walker? Now, those of us in fundraising, we know there's nothing wrong with upgrading and renewing a donor. It's standard operating procedure. But Madam Walker was not having it. She sat down and wrote him this letter and said, what, what, what do you mean? This is not our understanding. You said $300 would be helpful. Have I missed my mark? I want to help Tuskegee. I'm, you know, work with me here. I want to give you thousands of dollars, but I can't. Right now, I'm giving you hundreds. Work with me. See me for who I am. Then she hits him with this. I am unlike your white friends who have waited until they were rich and then help but have in proportion to my success, I have reached out and am helping others. I'm unlike your white friends. Well, who are Booker T. Washington's white friends? Well, Andrew Carnegie was on the Tuskegee board. He gave $600,000 to Tuskegee to seed the endowment, right? We know he's a legend in the world of philanthropy. Um, and, and he's one of the leading white friends of, of Tuskegee, right? But he has this model of spending your life accumulating wealth and then kind of later in life turning to things philanthropic and engaging in those ways. And that's not what Madam Walker is doing. She's giving along the way. She's saying, don't, don't compare me to Carnegie and don't interact with me the way, the way you do with him. I'm doing something fundamentally different. See me for who I am. There's also Olivia Sage the leading white woman philanthropist of the era, right? Who um, was married to Russell Sage, right? Um, very wealthy, extraordinarily wealthy, but during her lifetime couldn't really engage because of sexism and, and the constraints of marriage for women. But once he dies and she inherits all his millions, she goes on a philanthropic giving spree that is legendary. 
She funds the environment. She opens up higher education for women. She's helping to develop social work as a profession. She is in the thick of it, right? But again, she's doing something different. You see, Madam Walker didn't have anybody from whom to inherit money, right? And she's in the economy, in the workforce her entire life. For when she's a child, she's actively creating the wealth that she's giving away. So again, it's a fundamentally different context that doesn't apply. And yet, you know, she's, she's, she's saying, see me for who I am and relate to me in my own context. And so it's important to understand what is that context. Um, Madam Walker comes out of many different networks of women, philanthropic women, generous women who were pillars in their community. And again, these are some of the things that those Black women's historians write about that we in philanthropic and nonprofit studies need to embrace and engage more often, right? So I'm going to start with washer women, and then it's church women and club women and fraternal women, and then we'll talk about the Walker women because she organizes her own employees later in life. We know from the works of, of, of great Black women's historians like Tara Hunter from Princeton University that washerwomen were pillars of their community, that they would come together and, 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 and pool their resources to wash their clients' laundry together and then go back and, and deliver those to those clients. But all too often, those clients stiffed them and wouldn't pay them or tried to give them something else instead of the money they were due. And so during the Reconstruction era, these historians have shown how many Black washerwomen organized themselves into washing societies to demand for labor and wage protections from local municipalities because of all this abuse. We also know that they created what, what, what Dr. Hunter calls consumption strategies, that they pooled their resources together. They looked after each other's children. They pooled monies together to, to deal with issues in the community, right? So there's this vibrant culture of sharing and collaboration and working together. That's, that's, that's just an, an essential nature of how they did their work. And Madam Walker was one of them, right? And she was very proud of the fact that she was a washerwoman. So it's important to understand this network. And Carter G. Woodson, the great historian Carter G. Woodson, did a study on black washerwomen in the 1930s. And he noted how they were the first, often the first persons that charities would go to to ask for money. So not only are they taking care of their homes and their families and their children, but they're being actively engaged in the community. It's important to understand Madam Walker in that context. The next context are church women and club women. Um, again, I, I said when she went to St. Louis, she was embraced by the St. Paul AME Church. Here's a picture of St. Paul's AME Church and one of the women that she met and befriended, Jessie Batch Robinson. She was an activist. She was a member in the church, a leader in the church. She helped to run the Might Missionary Society, which was a group of Black women that were actively receiving and taking in the migrants arriving from the South and helping them to get settled. Right, And that these women were activists. They were speaking truth to power. They were fighting Jim Crow in their own, in their own cities and trying to open up oppor opportunities. And young Sarah sees all this. This is a new world, right? This, this Black-owned institution, this church where Black people are in leadership and Black people are speaking truth to power and providing for each other. It's a whole different world from the horrors of Delta, Louisiana. And so it's no mistake that in 1912, a newspaper reported after interviewing Madam Walker that it was in St. Louis in this environment that she learned it was her mission and her responsibility to help others and to give to the poor. So it's important to understand these church women and these club women. Jesse Batch Robinson would go on to work for Madam Walker's company. Uh, and again, it was a lifelong friendship. Fraternal women. Madam Walker came out of fraternal women. And uh, not, not talking about the, the, the divine nine here, right? We're not talking about the collegiate higher education fraternities and sororities. I'm talking about fraternal orders that preexisted the divine nine. And so the Order of Court of Calanthe was one such fraternal organization that she was a part of, uh, likely began in St. Louis and continued throughout most of her life. The Court of Calanthe was organized around the idea of charity. They had rituals and levels that you would work through to, to to, to move through leadership and to do projects on behalf of the community. And they valued fellowship and working together and helping others. She was a, a Calanthian and she comes out of that tradition as well. It's important to see her on her own terms. And then lastly, there are the Walker women. Uh, when you became an agent or an employee of the Walker Company where you could sell the products uh, door to door, you could open up a salon out of your own living room, um, uh, Madam Walker wanted you to do more than just make money and take care of your own. She wanted you to engage in the struggle. She wanted you to contribute something to the race, as she would have put it. And so she organized her agents into agent clubs, benevolent clubs. Very often they were called Walker clubs. And she said, sell products 
and do charity. So there's all these wonderful reports in the archive about the agents noting how they donated money or furniture to a local historically black college, or that they were doing a fundraiser for a school, or they're doing something for the NAACP. These women took it to heart. And then Madam Walker in 1917 began organizing them into a national conference. And so the agents would gather from around the country and meet and review the latest techniques in beauty care, but they would also deal with the pressing social issues at hand. And during one of these conventions, uh, they, they wrote a resolution condemning lynching and asking and demanding for public policy protections, and they signed it and sent it to President Woodrow Wilson. She's harnessing the power, the collective power of women to move the needle on social change. So these, my friends, are the networks that make sense for Madam Walker. And, and, and it's important in this moment because a diverse America is standing up during this moment of racial reckoning and saying, hey, we're unlike our dear white brothers and sisters. We're having a fundamentally different experience of this thing called America. And we need people to understand that and grapple with that and let's work together to address it. And we see the same thing in the world of philanthropy and fundraising. Donors of color are standing up and saying, hey, we come from a little bit of a different tradition. We think about this a little bit differently, but, but respect us and see us for who we are and engage us on these terms. And that's for a field, right? Remember where fundraising comes from, right? The public relations professionals who gave us the modern notion of a campaign who crafted fundraising as we know it were really developing structures that appealed to white businessmen at the turn of the 20th century. So we've got to grapple with that in the ways in which we structure our own, our own fundraising. And so Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving not only gives us access to this deep heritage and this history, it also helps us to understand the current landscape of giving in this community. This is a model that I develop in the book and that I talk about to try to give a sense of what that landscape looks like. And so of course the black church is still front and center, it's still foundational, it's still the premier institution that is actively teaching philanthropic values and in which people are regularly practicing it. It is responding to a range of social needs and it's just really a bedrock institution. If we start at 12 o'clock and work our way around, there are still kinship and community-based forms of giving where people are looking after after each other, neighbors helping neighbor, extended family members helping extended family members. These are the kinds of ways of giving that don't show up on your tax return, that are difficult to track, right? But they are the bedrock in how people get by and get through. And of course, there are high net worth individuals in the community, and no, not all of them are in sports and entertainment, right? They are across all areas of endeavor and achievement. And increasingly, they're turning to some of the professional tools of philanthropy, be it family foundations, donor advised funds, philanthropic advisors, right? They're taking advantage of, of these things. And, and we all know that there's an explosion of giving circles going on right now. It's just popping up all over the place and people who never thought about themselves as philanthropists are now engaging. This is especially happening amongst black women. Black women's giving circles are popping up all over the place, right? But it's an extension of this history because in many ways the Calanthians and the club women operated as giving circles of such in the ways that they pooled their resources to respond to the needs of the day. So in many ways, this generation is just doing what their foremothers were, were doing. And there are infrastructure and capacity building organizations. Some of the legacy ones are like UNCF and others that are actively fundraising and, and developing resources and in developing the capacity of the community to give. And there are a whole array of identity-based networks and associations, Blacks and philanthropy groups. And we're seeing those expand in other communities of color, Native Americans and philanthropy, Hispanics and philanthropy. There's all these groups that are advocating for equity and grant making and, and, and more and fairer and equal practices in, in the professional world of, of philanthropy. And I don't even touch on here the, the, the robust social media universe of black philanthropy. There are so many hashtags and so many groups and, and people asserting themselves and presenting themselves and say, hey, I, I'm a philanthropist and I give too. So there's a vibrant world going on that again, we may not see it, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so it's important, Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving gives us access to this history and to the current state of things that we can take with us as we pose our research questions, as we engage in social change and think about what's going on. And so 
I wanted to uh, note that Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving helps us understand so many different things. And of course, it helps us understand Oprah, right? Um, Oprah Winfrey is not a, 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 a black Carnegie or a black sage. Oprah Winfrey comes out of Walker's tradition. Oprah was taught to give by her grandmother, who was a church woman and a club woman, and taught her these values. And, and Oprah very much operates uh, commercial, you know, blends her business and her philanthropy in a way that often seems seamless. It doesn't quite, you know, uh, it, 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 it's very integrated. Same thing Madam Walker was doing 100 plus years ago. But my friends, again, this is not only about the elite. Uh, because Madam Walker was a millionaire, all too often we use that to separate her from her peers. I'm trying to put her in context so you can see she was doing what people did in her community. She just had a very unique platform from which to do it and put her own stamp. And so Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving explains Oprah Winfrey, but guess what? It also explains my mother, Carolyn Cooper Freeman, South Orange, New Jersey. She's a church woman. She's a club woman. She would give the shirt off her back to help any one of you right now if she knew it would make a difference, right? This is that kind of generosity. It's not about what you have. It's about what you do with it. And so it's important to, to see philanthropy in all the places and spaces that it exists. And so Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving also gives us access to groups like SPIN. SPIN, the Sisterhood of Philanthropists, Impacting Needs. This is a group out of Denver, Colorado. They're a giving circle. Each member uh, donates $1 per year into a fund and collectively they make grants to youth organizations and to racial and gender justice organizations. This group is called DAP, Denver African American Philanthropists, Black men doing the same thing, right? Uh, they're active and doing the same thing in, in, in their community. And oh, and this, this organization is very interesting. The Young Black and Giving Back Institute out of Washington, D.C., started by a dynamite young black millennial uh, who said, hey, everybody's talking about the millennials are changing America and they're changing the nonprofit sector, but I never see them interviewing or asking black and brown millennials what they think. So what does she do? She started this organization, and now she does board trainings for black and brown millennials. She does strategy development. She's, keep, she's connecting them to social movements and to activisms and helping them to think about philanthropy as something that can grow with them and be a part of them as their lives and their careers progress. There's a vibrant world of black philanthropy going on that, again, just because we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And then lastly, the Divine Nine. I mentioned them earlier. This happens to be the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, but all of the members of the Divine Nine have their own dedicated philanthropic initiatives, and they have for generations. And I, I highlighted this group because just a few years ago, they publicly announced a national $10 million campaign where they intend to give $100,000 $100,000 endowments to every single historically black college in the country, and they've already started fulfilling that pledge. In fact, they were a big part of the group that helped to save Bennett College in North Carolina earlier last year. And they are gearing up for next month because their soror is on the vice presidential candidate, uh, is, is the vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris, and they are doing all sorts of voter registration things too. Again, continuing this legacy of activism and engagement that their foremothers were doing 100 plus years ago. So this vibrant world is something that Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving gives us access to. But there's a problem. There's a problem of engagement in the world of philanthropy and fundraising. We know from national studies that people of color report lower levels of, of cultivation and solicitation than white donors. And that, my friends, is a problem that fundraisers and advancement professions have created. And, but we have the key to begin addressing those. We need to address some institutional and structural barriers to engagement. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's some big ones that are beyond the reach of any one person and even one institution. We're going to have to wrap our heads around some of them together as Americans and figure them out, such as wealth inequality, right? The legacies of slavery and Jim Crow are real when public policy is formulated so that certain people have access to low rate mortgages and certain people don't. Certain people can move to the suburbs and have great schools and certain people don't. That has implications for the kinds of fundraising calls we're making because wealth can be generational. Right? But public policy has prevented many people from doing that, right? So we've got to deal with those larger issues because they have relevance for the day-to-day -day fundraising that we try to do. There's also exclusion within our institutions. 
We know donors of color want to see diversity on your boards, right? They want to see it in our staffs. They want to see it in our programming. They want to know, just like every other donor, donor what have you done for me lately, right? They want to see um, beyond tokenism. They want power and influence and know that your organization is grappling with these, uh, these issues, right? So, so dealing with exclusion in our organizations. And perhaps we belong to organizations that have caused harm in the past. I know my own institution is, sits right on top of what used to be a very vibrant and prosperous black neighborhood. And it was only 50 years ago that that neighborhood was destroyed so the campus could thrive. There are still people in Indianapolis today who were in that neighborhood and who remember and who have very deep and, and, and resentful feelings, right? That has implications when it's time to do fundraising. That has implications with whether or not they see our institutions as being hospitable and, 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 some, and a resource that can be engaged. And so we've got to deal with these histories as they, however they have evolved for our institutions. There also can be, back to this fundraising issue, problems with the minimum amounts we sometimes arbitrarily assign to our campaigns because they help us, they make our, our lives easier as the professionals responsible for doing them. But if we require certain levels for a scholarship to be endowed or for a fund to be established, right, we need to start thinking about does that create a barrier? Um, how could we open up the, the, the universe of prospective donors who might give if we just changed the minimum amounts, right? I have a great story I might share in the, in the question and answer period about how the Smithsonian's campaign for the National Museum of African American History raised over $5 million from a, a large number of African American donors by simply changing the amounts and working with people where they were instead of forcing them to join them into uh, an area that didn't fit them. So those are some of the institutional barriers to the problems of engagement that we must address. There's also some interpersonal barriers that prevent connection and engagement with donors of color that the gospel of giving brings to our awareness. Well, first is the myth. The myth out there, donors of color, people of color don't give. People of color don't have a history of giving. People of color don't care or they only support their organizations. Don't bother if you're not one of their organizations. I just showed you the history that dispels those myths. This is a very generous uh, culture, very generous community. The key is how well are you, you building that trust and having those interactions that help to connect with that, that generosity. And of course, we've got to move beyond our homogenous networks, right? We've got to get out of our comfort zones and we've got to reach out and engage in ways we might not have done before. Uh, so that we can open up the potential and possibilities for people to come involved, become involved. And we've also got to continue to work on our own cultural competency. Again, that campaign for the Smithsonian was very successful because they had a culturally relevant case for support that resonated with Americans of all backgrounds. Right? We need to develop our competences. We need to understand these heritages and, and these, these histories and how it informs and activates people today uh, because that holds the key to, to engagement and reversing these horrible numbers where people of color say they aren't being engaged. So, so that, that's an important thing that the Gospel of Giving gives us access to. And so I'm going to close so we can get into coup discussion, but I want to summarize um, Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving. There are three points that I tried uh, to articulate to bring it clear again why she gave, how she gave, and what this model uh, can teach us. And the first point is simple. Give as you can, right? Start where you are. Philanthropy doesn't come from wealth. Philanthropy comes from generosity. It doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. It's a matter of what you do with it. And if you're willing to engage and willing to help someone, right? There's always someone else in a, in a worse situation who can benefit um, from what you have or what you can offer. It doesn't have to be money. It could be something else. The second thing is spare no useful means or do all you can to be helpful to others, right? The need is so great. The issues are so pervasive, right? And so we're, you know, Madam Walker existed before there was tax policy defining a charitable deduction, right? She's not concerned about that. The income tax was just beginning to come online from the World War. She's not worried about those kinds of things. She's worried about how to help people. So that's why she put her company in service to the race, as she would say. She put her money in service to the race, her time, her voice, her talent, all these different things to bear on the issue of racism and sexism under Jim Crow. And lastly, give more as your means increase, right? As you acquire more, do more. Don't wait. We can't afford for people to, to spend their lives accumulating wealth and, and only later 
and at the end of life turn and start caring and engaging on important issues. The, the, the needs are too great. The issues are too pervasive. We need all hands on deck now. Uh, and so it's important, again, to think about uh, why this gospel of giving uh, gives voice to a way of engaging that belongs to all of us. Right? This is specifically Black women's history, but it's instructive for all of us because anybody can do this. Very few of us can do what Carnegie did. Very few of us can do what Olivia Sage did, but all of us can do what Madam Walker did. And so I offer you this gospel of giving as a way of giving access to this history um, and for seeing donors of color on their own terms. Um, it's a way of giving uh, everyone, regardless of race, class, gender, and culture, equal opportunity for engagement in our organizations and in our communities. And lastly, from an academic and scholarly perspective, it's a way of truly building the inclusive and representative histories that we all need and deserve. And so I'm going to close right there so we can have some discussion. But uh, thank you again for, for the opportunity and, and time to talk with you about it. And I uh, look forward to, to uh, your, your questions and your conversation. We can't hear you, Elisa. <laughs> I, uh, I know. Thank you so much. And it, we'll do a virtual clap, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so wonderful. much. And when I already have my book on pre-order from Amazon, so I can't wait till it gets here. And the next time we see each other, then you can sign it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That'd be fun. Thank I love you. your background. You have all your books up there. They're ready. That's right. They, they just arrived Amazing. last week, so I was really <laughs> excited and all that. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So I'll I'll turn it over Thank to you. the I'll turn it over to the chat and I'll I'll watch those questions and, and see as as they come in and I do want to remind people we are recording so you'll get the link um, this afternoon. Okay. Um, it sounds like this isn't necessarily the book you set out to write, right? You it it kind of morphed and changed mm -hmm. as you went on, or is this is this really what you were thinking of when you started writing? It seems like it's it's continued to evolve as you got into the research. Yeah, it definitely did. Um, you know, I didn't go into it thinking I was writing a book about Black women's philanthropy, for instance. I was, I was thinking just generally that it was going to tell me something about African American philanthropy overall, um, and then I would draw from that some larger lessons that could help us understand philanthropy as a human phenomenon. Right, but as I got into it, and, I, and again, I, I can't say enough how how important the Black women's historiography is. And, and, and being in conversation, because while I was writing, I was presenting at ARNOVA. I was presenting at the Black History Conferences, the Black Women's Conferences. I was presenting before groups of fundraisers and giving circles, um, again, to see what was resonating, what made sense, and what were the issues that I needed to address. And as I got deeper and deeper into it, it became clear that, that uh, Black women in this context uh, were the innovators and the leaders, uh, and that this was something unique in particular that was going on amongst them and how they saw themselves and their identity as women, as, as wives, as mothers, but also as church women and club women and activists, bringing their full selves right, to the issues that they were dealing with. So yeah, it definitely evolved um, over time. Um, and again, I'm grateful for people who've been part of this process with me. So you mentioned a couple of women who, uh, white women who inherited their wealth and then were able to give it away. I, I, um, I, I've seen that in other cases. That's so different than the black women's experience at the time. They weren't inheriting from their spouses. You know, they were earning those things, much like you talk about Oprah and, and other things. Do you see any other younger philanthropists right now uh, in the black community who are kind of modeling themselves on that? Um, Oprah's the next generation kind of thing. Do you see them out there? Well, you know, so there is another um, kind of vibrant black social entrepreneurship space that again mm. doesn't get a lot of attention. But, um, you know, since we're talking about Madam Walker, there's a group out of Washington, D.C. called Walker's Legacy. It is named for Madam Walker. It was started by a dynamite young woman named Natalie Cofield Madeira. And um, it brings together women of color who are business owners and civic leaders. And they are regularly doing webinars on tech issues, on, on developing capital for their startups. Um, they even have started a foundation where they have raised money and are actively training single black mothers on how to become entrepreneurs and self-sustaining. So again, there's so many things happening 
um, that again, don't, don't necessarily make the papers or don't come to mind when we think of, of who's a philanthropist or who's giving, but they're there nonetheless. So yes, there, there is an incredibly vibrant world going on right now that's very important. And we all need to be aware of it. And I hope that you know some of your students may do some research in these spaces or, or join these spaces, develop their careers and make their contribution in these spaces because we, we need that leadership, we need that expertise. So on that note, I'm, I wanted to do a poll to see, so you know kind of who's in the room. Let's see. Oh, absolutely. Just so we know um, for our own sense of who's in the room. So I'm going to launch this poll. Um, and this is a select all, select as many as apply. Are you an NIU student, a staff or faculty, a staff or board member, maybe a student at another university um, or other? So we'll just kind of see who's in the room so you know <laughs> as, as we start to talk about some of these issues, we'll see, um, see who's there. So I'll wait till there's about 70% of the folks. Some, some people have already remarked they heard about this presentation through your LinkedIn. <laughs> so thank you for promoting oh. it. <laughs> we okay. were promoting it on ours too, but I appreciate it. Okay, sure. Um, I absolutely. think there's about 75% voted, so let me share that. So you can kind of see who's in the room as well. So we do, we have almost 30% okay. are NIU students and, and uh, another, another uh, quarter there is faculty. Um, and many of them serve That's on wonderful. nonprofit board members or, or staff. Yeah. So what would you say yeah. to the, the nonprofit folks who are in the room who are doing this, this fundraising work? How do they need to think differently about cultivating um, African-Americans and supporting their causes? Yeah, um, I, I think so. I kind of hinted at some of this. I think we do need to do the work of dealing with um, our institutions, our organizations, and how we do fundraise, uh, how we do fundraising. Um, are we kind of erecting barriers that make it a little more difficult for people needlessly? Um, you know, I never really thought about that until I was doing this work about, you know, how minimum amounts can really be a deterrent, right? Um, somebody has the desire to give, but they can't really meet your, 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 your goal, right? Um, but what if we work with them? What if we did something different? right and kind of met them in between and that was um, uh, the example I, I, I hinted at was um, I interviewed a fundraiser from the the Smithsonian campaign for the book and they talked about how they initially started thinking about well how could we find people who could give $25,000 a year and what would that look like and that would be a relatively small list but then when they changed that and they said who could give us $5,000 a year for five years mm -hmm. that opened up a much bigger pool and then they started going out and developing Developing networks and you know engaging their own networks creating new ones right and and they were blown away by the response they ended up with over 1,000 people giving at that 5,000 to $20,000 level um, on an annual basis and that group is still active still growing and still engaged in the life of the museum because again it tapped into something bigger and, and meaningful that resonated with the ways in which um, these communities give um, and, and it gave them a chance to contribute and be a part of something bigger. So um, those are the kinds of things I try to direct people's attention to as we, we grapple with how to do fundraising a little bit differently and how to put the community uh, at the center and, and engage them in, in meaningful and respectful ways. So you talked, to, you talked about how the church is really the center of African-American giving and both monetarily volunteer, neighbor, all of that kind of stuff. Um, how would an organization go about working with their local church community when they're not part of it? I mean, that's, that's also a, a barrier if you're not part of that community. What do you, what do you suggest there? How can we reach out through the, the church function? Yeah, um, and, and the honest answer is they may not be able to. Yeah. Um, that again, many of these organizations already have their philanthropic agendas and are mm -hmm. actively engaging. Others are interested in partnering. So really it's about building those relationships first and earning that trust. And have you invited them to the table before beyond money? Are they actively a part of, you know, your theory of change, right? And how yeah. are you, you know, complementing what they're doing and how might they complement what you're doing so that you can co co collectively, right, work together and push the needle on these issues. So it's not as simple as just walk, you know, knocking on the door and starting to talk with them. You really have to, to build that, that connection. And also it's important to remember, you know, communities of color have this experience of being entered into by people who come in with, say, say they come in with good intentions, but then when things don't go the way they initially thought or that sort of thing, they leave. And very often they can leave behind a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of anger, yeah. right? And so that the next time uh, somebody comes through, all that is there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we've got to be very 
um, intentional when we do this. And we have to constantly check our own motivations and say, are we inviting people to the table and asking to be invited to their table as equals and as co-creators, right? Or are we really just trying to get something and then we're going to run if it doesn't produce what we hope is going to produce in six months or a year? This is a long-term proposition. You know, you wouldn't start a new annual fund program and expect it to be fully operational and fully profitable within one year. Right. You know it's going to take you five to seven years to get that thing going. Same thing with plan giving, right? You wouldn't expect returns in one year. That's, that's, that's a 20-year proposition. That's the long game, right? Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to these racial equity issues, we've got a long game to play. We, we, we've, we've got to be in it for the long haul. And all these people who are pouring unprecedented amounts of donations into racial equity issues and causes, I say to you, keep giving, make the same gift next year, right? And, and, and make long-term provisions and don't give up, keep pushing and trust the organizations, trust them to do the work that's needed um, so that we can keep moving this needle together. And how does the, the kind of tax policy, I know we're both not accountants or anything, but how does the tax policy influence mm. giving? <laughs> Um, you were talking about that the, the tax policy really didn't exist in Madam C.J. Walker's. Do you think it would have changed some of her giving or now that it's, you know, very few actually itemize their taxes at all. So there's lots of giving that goes unseen, as you said, or just unmeasured. How do you think that ties in? Because one of the one of the policy proposals is to really reduce that to allow everybody to do charitable deductions regardless. So do you think that's right. getting at that? Yeah, you know, and I have colleagues at, at the School of Philanthropy here at, at IUPUI who are actually experts in that and can go talk <laughs> policy with you all day. For me, I think it's important because um, I, I think we've, we've allowed kind of those governmental definitions of what counts as a gift to kind of skew our, our view of what's important when it comes to philanthropy. And obviously, it's easy to measure money. It's easy to, to, you know, to track the flow of formal donations through formal 501c3s. And that's important. I'm not knocking that at all. But when it comes to understanding these historical precedents and this heritage, we have to think differently. We have to think broadly. And we can't automatically go to whoever's giving the most as if they're the only parts of the story and the only ones who matter. The rest of us matter too. Like I said, most of us will never do what Carnegie was doing, right? But we have a role to play in this. And, and there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of movement now. The Gates Foundation has a philanthropy for all initiative trying to engage the everyday person in giving. I think that's where this issue of public po policy comes into play. What can we do to encourage more people um, to do more, um, to respond to these needs? While also, I think, asking our institutions to do more, right? Um, so there's, th that's how I think about how these things interact. I don't know if they would have influenced Madam Walker. You know, the, the studies tend to show that the deduction doesn't really come to mind for people when they give. There are always people who unload money at the end of the tax year, right, for, for various reasons. But in the big scheme of things, the research tends to say it's, it's less, uh, less meaningful. But again, my colleagues are better equipped to talk about what kinds of public policies will actually unleash the kinds of things that, that people hope will happen. <laughs> So Renique had a question. Um, she said, yeah. I think it's in the chat there. She's, she said, it's interesting to hear the phrase about um, understanding Madam C.J. Walker's in her own context. I'm curious about how this applies to sharing the stories of impact. And so much of funders now are saying, you need to demonstrate your impact, show your impact. How does that context and consideration of the audience may be also important? So if we're trying to do more outreach and more engagement with the Black community, how do we need to be talking about impact differently? How can we do it better? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I guess I would think about that in terms of, um, one, I think grant makers need to do a better job of understanding the, the context of the organizations that they're funding. And so the other part of this movement, there's, uh, there's already already been advocacy in this space, but it's been accelerated in terms of saying, hey, let's have less strings with gifts. Let's have less reporting requirements. Let's trust the organizations more. They have the expertise. They're closer to it. Don't bog them down in these kinds of bureaucratic things, which, which have real costs and take away from doing mission, right? So yeah. I'm glad that those voices and that conversation is being amplified. I do think it's important to always be educating your donors about the context in which you're operating and what what is really impacting the people who you're serving, what they really need and what it takes to provide that. Um, and, to, and to not be ashamed at that. Um, you know, um, w overhead is very important, right? And for a long time, there was this idea we shouldn't be funding overhead and that sort of thing. But right, I mean, th that, that's the key. I mean, you know, essentially, you know, in higher ed, a scholarship is basically overhead. 
it goes right into the general fund. It's paying tuition, right? Um, but but it's when and when people give money to political campaigns, right? They're paying for overhead. They're buying ads and they're buying you know staff and you know so nonprofits need those resources. So I think it's important to be open and honest with your funders and say, hey, here's what it really takes to move the needle here and do what we're trying to do. We need you to see that and understand this context um, because it's not necessarily that simple. It's more complex. It's more nuanced. And and let's partner. And, 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 and I love it. There's, there's people like Vule and others in the space who are saying, you know, do 20 year grants, stop this one year grant stuff. And, you know, so there's interesting ideas out there that are challenging all of us to think differently about how we do business in the space of philanthropy, because, you know, social change is riding on it. People's lives are riding on it. And so we've got to be open. We have another question coming in. Um, you spoke about the importance of gift officers and other people working in this fundraising space acquiring a level of cultural competence. Um, what's your thoughts around that if you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think it's... Um... So I, so I have a, an op-ed in, in the October Chronicle of Philanthropy, and I, I try to make this point um, that um, I, I think it's important for organizations to go through institution-wide you know, racial equity change initiatives, right? All of us have blind spots. Our institutions have histories. We may not even know what's, go, what's been going on or how people have experienced us, but we need to go through that. While that is happening, or while we're waiting for that to happen, I think individual fundraisers and advancement professionals have sufficient power to begin taking action in their daily lives because by and large, they control their daily schedule. Fundraisers determine who gets a phone call and who doesn't. They determine who gets invited to the event and who doesn't, uh, who gets attention and who doesn't. And go, again, go back, you know, donors of color saying people aren't contacting us. Right. So that's something you can change right now. And so to the extent that that myths may be a part of, of, of preventing that consciously, unconsciously, um, again, our image of who gives and has resources, it's, it's a white image. Right. Our media regularly focuses our attention on very wealthy white people doing this. And every now and then there's a black and brown person who does it. Uh, right. And we get excited and we tell their story. But then we go back to focusing on on the usual suspects. But what I hope this book does is expand that notion, along with, again, this social media conversation that's going on and, and so many other things happening in the space that says, you know, the face of philanthropy is, is just as diverse as the country. And there are more people out there willing and interested in supporting and doing important work in the community. And fundraisers get to be on the front line of that. Fundraisers help to build social capital in communities, right? When I was a fundraiser, I, I as, as a young Black man, found myself in the living rooms of some of the wealthiest white people in Indianapolis. <laughs> there, was no other, there were no other circumstances in the world that would have allowed me to be in their living rooms, right? But fundraising gave me that opportunity. So what would it be like if we as fundraisers and as advancement folks and others in the space took that to heart and thought about what is the potential here for, for relationship building in a much larger way that speaks to these bigger issues that we, even beyond the gift, right? Getting to know each other and enter into each other's lives in a different way. Um, I just think that, that our space offers those opportunities if we'll, we'll, we'll think about them and grapple with how to engage them. You know, we um, here at NIU, we have an undergraduate program in nonprofit and NGO studies. And I would say our, our students are more diverse um, than the community and even NIU in many respects. I don't know how many of them are considering fundraising as a career. You know, what's something that you would tell them, particularly our students of color, why they should pursue a career in fundraising? What are the opportunities there? Well, it is an incredible um, noble field with a lot of opportunities. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it's not something that I, I uh, knew officially existed um, as a career option. And I, I stumbled into it. I happened to take a class on grant proposal writing when I was in graduate school. And then that was what I emphasized on my resume. And I got my first job basically as a proposal writer for an organization. Um, and then I, I, they, they sent me to the fundraising school and I learned that there was much more to it. Um, but there are incredible opportunities in the world of fundraising and advancement. Um, there, you can work in so many different types of organizations. You could virtually pick the mission that's of interest to you, but you can work in, in education, in health, in the arts, in social services, in international affairs, right? So you can follow that passion. But once you master these skills, you can take them anywhere. And you can work in a small neighborhood-based organization, or you could work in a large multinational global nonprofit or NGO, right? Um, and you can really grapple with these 
these issues and make a contribution. And one of the things I, I liked about being a fundraiser was that it allowed me to make a contribution, but I was more in the background because the social workers I was raising money for, they were kind of doing the change work with, with the students and with the young people and with the families or or the, the scholarships I was raising when I worked for a university right it was, it was the professors and the advisors who were really working with the students but I got to contribute something even though I didn't possess those particular clinical skills or those service skills so it was a powerful way to contribute and let me tell you we have this image of, of the nonprofit sector as re requiring a vow of poverty as um, um, you know, not having many opportunities for advancement. That's just not true. Um, there are, particularly in fundraising, felt fundraising is a very well compensated career. Um, and, and again, there are numerous opportunities. So I encourage everyone, uh, particularly, you know, your students and your students of color to to think about it. Um, and, and the association. Yeah, just case, turned it off. You lost Sorry, me? Go ahead. Nope, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, and so, you know, groups like uh, Association of Fundraising Professionals, CASE, the Council for Advancement of, and uh, Support of Education, they all have mentoring programs for young people to encourage them to join uh, in the field. Um, you, you can build an incredible life of service and engagement through a, a philanthropy career in fundraising. So I encourage everyone to do it. So tell us about the fundraising school, because I don't know if um, many students or even working professionals know that there's a school dedicated to studying fundraising. Do you, is it a degree certifying or is it professional development or both? Yeah, so um, I feel very privileged because I used to be the associate director of the fundraising in school. So basically it is a, it's an international training program that is based on a curriculum. And, and the curriculum will teach you all aspects of fundraising, from annual giving to planned giving to capital campaigns to how to use social media, how to engage women as donors, uh, engage in communication and marketing. And, and these courses are offered in a continuing education format. And so some of them, the longest one is four days, the shortest one is one day, um, and you get to come together with other professionals in the space um, and, and have this tremendous learning experience where you get to learn the fundamental skills, and then you can take them back to your organization and practice them. And if you earn, you know, if you take four courses, you can earn a certificate in fundraising management, and we have a new certificate in philanthropic leadership. Um, so again, it, it gives you a continuing education format for learning these skills. And as I said, my first job out, out of grad school, my organization sent me to the fundraising school and I took their, their, at that time, the course was five days. This was their intro course. And it just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it, that there was more to it than just writing proposals and that there was skill and technique to it and that you could learn these things. And then more broadly, you know, um, even if you don't think of yourself as, as in that way, there's, there's so many spaces in fundraising where you can go. If you want to do events, you know, there, there are organizations where people, all they do in fundraising is develop the events. If you want to be behind the scenes, larger institutions like universities and museums will have development services professionals who are doing research and managing accounts and, and managing relationships with donors. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there's so many ways that talents can be applied um, in this field. And the fundraising school helps you develop those skills uh, while you're on the job. Um, and increasingly, we're, we're seeing our undergraduate and our master's level students take the courses while they're in school. And so we, we encourage people to, to come check us out. You could do them um, in various, well, before COVID, we were in a whole bunch of cities around the country. Now we're starting to open back up, but we've, all, we've been online for over a decade. So these things are also available online. So we have one course in our undergraduate sequence that's philanthropy and fundraising, and it's a survey, okay. basically a survey course. So every week, almost, <laughs> we do a different form of fundraising. Half the course is dedicated to um, why people give. And a lot of uh -huh. what we know in terms of the research, you know, isn't very inclusive. As you said, we need to do more research in those areas to make sure that we're giving a, a broader picture. And then the other half is really around the yeah. technique uh, of fundraising, like how to yeah. do it as, as we think about all those things. What, what and you mentioned it a couple times when you were talking about what research do we still need to do? I mean, I'm sure after you've done this book, you're like, I'm not sure I wanna tackle another book project right away. But for you and maybe yourself or other people in the field, what do you think, where, do, where are some more gaps that we need to really investigate? So we have a a more holistic picture. Yeah, no, actually, I'm already working on the second book, so <laughs> <laughs> got to keep moving, got to keep uh, moving. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I think, and again, I think um, centering people of color, 
uh, and how that impacts our understanding of philanthropy is important. Uh, my book is specifically about African American history, but we need to do the same kind of work with indigenous populations, native peoples, right, with Hispanic uh, community. Um, you know, LGBTQ is a growing area of inquiry. There's some great studies being done by my, my friends at Columbia, Noah Dresner, Columbia's Teachers College and, and Elizabeth Dale out at Seattle University. Um, these are entire spaces that are waiting because the motivations are a little bit different and the contexts are a little bit different. And, you know, for, for a long time, fundraising has focused on segmenting donors and really understanding them on their own terms. Um, we have a genuine opportunity to do that by understanding and centering the experiences of these different groups and how their philanthropy has evolved and shaped and how that should be and can be effectively um, reflected back to them um, in the ways in which we engage and cultivate and support that. So, um, you know, I mentioned Noah Dreser. He has a great study on philanthropic mirroring, which looks exactly at this. It's the idea that if you reflect two donors of color, their cultural heritage in your solicitations, they're more likely to respond and more likely to respond at higher amounts. Um, so people want to be seen, they want to be engaged, they want to be understood. And I think this, that that's a whole space that's eager for people to, to jump in and join Noah and Elizabeth and others um, in, in doing that kind of work. And I think we need to know more about this history. We need a more inclusive history so that we can really understand the origins of philanthropy and learn to see it as a human phenomenon, not a white phenomenon, as, as something that's accessible to all of us, not just the richest among us. So that, that's where I, I would direct people in, and those are the kinds of, of, of kind of work that I'm trying to do. Now, I probably would be remiss because I, I really want to read your book, but uh, maybe some people have seen the Netflix uh, series on, okay. on Madam C.J. Walker. How, how do we, did you yeah. participate in that? And kind of bring us up to speed on her family. Are they still involved and yeah. in how you worked with them on the book? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, Madam Walker's great-great-granddaughter is someone who I reached out to very, very early in this project. Um, her name is Alilia Bundles, and um, she is an award-winning journalist in her own right. Mm. So she's worked for ABC News. She was a news producer. She's worked with many of the famous people you've seen on television over the years. She was one of those people behind the scenes talking into their ears. She's an excellent writer uh, and, and a journalist, an activist journalist herself in an Ida B. Wells kind of way. So it's been a pleasure to be in conversation with her and to have access to the family's private archives um, and, and, and- Oh, Delia's and, here. And, 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 you know, <laughs> she's letting you know in the chat that she's, she's here. here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there she is, Hello. right? Yes, right. So <laughs> there she is, right? And so <clears throat> um, it, it's been uh, an important to be in conversation with her. Uh, there she is, I see her now. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've had many conversations. And so, and, and the other thing, you know, in the story, I, I, I highlight the life of a man named Freeman B. Ransom, who was pretty much her right hand man, Madam Walker's right hand man, an attorney, a race man in his own right, a politician active in the Indianapolis community. And one of the beautiful things I think about, uh, about this story is that Madam Walker's descendants and, and Freeman Ransom's descendants have a deep love and appreciation and friendship and relationship that lasts to this day. So something that started 100 years ago is still very much beautiful and a part of love life today. And so to be able to see that, to be invited into it was a great privilege for me. So I'm always grateful to Alilia Bundles and to uh, Judith Ransom Lewis uh, for many conversations. And so the Netflix series, you know, um, it, it was- um, It's it, TV, it was, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. TV, um, it, it, it's Hollywood trying to reach a broader audience, but many, many historians, myself included, felt like Madam Walker's life was dramatic enough that if you just lay out its contours and run with that, you'd have what you need. But it is what it is. It brought more people to Madam's story. Hopefully they will read more. Hopefully they will go to the online archives and dig in and engage and, and, and look at the letters for themselves and, and touch history um, and think about things a little bit differently in their own connection and how they can be informed for Madam Walker. Um, you know, I, I write about the book that this is specifically Black women's heritage, but it's something that belongs to all of us. I think all Americans can find something in this story, and it's so important. And that's why I think this idea of, of giving for the rest of us or philanthropy for the rest of us is so important. Aaliyah, just because you're here, did you want to say hi and, and add anything from your perspective about all of these people showed up to hear more about one of your ancestors? That's just amazing. 
Well, you know, it's just been such a pleasure to work with Tyrone from the time he was first beginning to write about Madam Walker. And I totally enjoyed this conversation. Every time I listen to him, every time we have a conversation, I learn something new. And it's really exciting for me that there's somebody else who knows as much as I do about Madam Walker and then can reimagine and engage and bring some scholarly critique to it. So I, I'm thrilled and I just, you know, congratulations, Tyrone. Thank you oh, thank so you. much. Thank you so much. <laughs> so there's a couple of a uh, couple of questions kind of in the chat um, as we're as we're having our conversation. When you talk about, um, let's see here, there was one up here. Um, we talked about cultural competence, and I think that you know that's an area for students. We need to think about how do we do that. I often think our students are ahead of faculty on some of this stuff. But what are the challenges that you see there? Opportunities, I guess, to to bring students into this work. Yeah, um, I, I think it's important to, to think about curriculum. Yeah. I think it's important to, to be aware of who we're centering and whose traditions and practices we're centering when we go about the difficult task of teaching philanthropy um, and, and how to uh, be more representative and engaging, not just for the sake of inclusion, but for the sake of really trying to understand, again, philanthropy as a human phenomenon that belongs to all of us and not just some of us. So that's very important. And that's what, you know, I hope that this book contributes to that and gives people a resource they can draw upon and others, those Black women's historians I talked about. Wow, they are doing some incredible stuff. And the interesting thing about them is that, that after interacting with them, they, they do not have a primary intellectual commitment to the study of philanthropy, right? They're interested in other things. Their commitments are to really engaging and un uncovering and understanding Black life on its own on its own ground, to borrow from Alohia Bundles, right? Um, and, and to understand what's going on. And so in the process, they had to grapple with Black philanthropy because that's what their subjects were doing, right? And so they're less interested in these insights, though they created some incredible insights about what philanthropy is, who does it, how it's done, what its impact is. And so it was a privilege for me to kind of follow behind them and to kind of pick up on the things. And then coming from my philanthropic lens, I was able to make connections that perhaps they weren't and to see things um, that, that would, I you know, thought would bring uh, more insights back to philanthropic and nonprofit studies. So I think there's great, there's a great more of, uh, a lot more of uh, interdisciplinary work to do, that we expand our notion of the fields that contribute to philanthropic studies, open up, welcome these scholars into the fold, and hopefully they, they will take to philanthropy and more intentionally and deliberately go and explore. When they do that, wow, who knows what they're going to find and come up then, um, you know? So, uh, but, but I've also written that it's, you know, it's because it's unfortunate that, um, you know, you can study the history of philanthropy and not encounter African Americans, right? But you cannot study the history of African Americans without encountering their philanthropy. So we've got to fix that. That. And I think curriculum is a part of that. But to do the curriculum, we need the research. Right. So for those students who are out there or people thinking about going back to school, um, you know, the, the, the Lilly School is, is just such an amazing um, place and, and certainly one of the pioneers in this uh, study or one of the few schools in the country that does anything like this at the graduate level, at the PhD level for sure. Um, and the field just keeps exploding um, in terms of opportunities that are out there. So for those of you who are thinking about graduate school, certainly check out the Lilly School, but there are others. And I think that's, that's the interesting thing. Everybody's coming at this from very different perspectives. I came from public administration. And so we're, those, those traditions we're trying to bring into philanthropy. And I like a lot of what you talked about in terms of how we view philanthropy, how we study it. It's, it's more around generosity than it is of counting dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it gives me hope in this period of, of COVID that we've seen people do a, a lot of amazing, very positive things during this period, just helping one another um, and, and volunteering and, and sometimes even risky things. Um, so I know that there is that that generosity spirit is not going away even during this pandemic. That's been really fun to, to yes. watch. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Very fun. absolutely. Right. The, the mutual aid traditions, yep. people have gone back to mutual aid. They've, they're looking after each other in ways that perhaps they weren't as visibly doing before. Right. So, yeah. So it's, so it's very important to recognize that. Any suggestions for those students or very early career professionals in their own generosity? How can they um, get engaged with nonprofit organizations or even non, uh, you know, 501c3 kind of things? Where do they decide to give their money? What advice on, on those, even if you have small amounts of money right now, which was in the tradition of, of Madam Walker, if you have small things, how do they get in, engaged and, and contribute even small sums right now and early in their careers? 
Yeah, so one of, one of the first activities we have students in my program do is write their philanthropic autobiography. And this mm. is a brief, brief essay where I ask them to think about the ways in which their lives have been touched by someone else's generosity. When has somebody given something to you, right? Or how has your life been involved? How have you been involved in, in philanthropy? And so this is an interesting exercise. We actually have our freshmen do it and we have our entering graduate students do it. Um, and then on, on, on the back end for the freshmen, when they're seniors, that's the first essay I have them take back out and say, okay, now that you've had four years here and you've studied this curriculum, you've had all these experiences, how would you revise and, and develop that to, to chart their own growth, right? But, but the philanthropic autobiography gives you a way of just saying, hey, how, how has my life been touched by philanthropy? How have I participated? How have I benefited by some, from somebody else's generosity? And, and people will note things that maybe they were in a little league or that they used to be a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout or they were part of a religious congregation and they saw people passing the plate or engaging in other types of rituals, right? Um, and, or there's other students who would say that, you know, my family didn't really have much, so we didn't really do things for Formally, but we looked after each other or, or we did these other kinds. So, so one, I would say, is connect with your own family and your own community's sense of, of philanthropy, giving, caring, sharing, whatever the word is, right? We all have these practices. You know, the people in my church would never dare use the word philanthropy. They were just, in their minds, doing the Lord's work, right? Doing what you're supposed to do, trying to make it into heaven. I mean, there's a whole different <laughs> way, right? <laughs> that they would describe what they were doing, but philanthropy wouldn't be one of them. So that sometimes we have to help people deal with the vocabulary. So let's say, what are those traditions? And then, then we talk to students about the moral imagination, right? So what, 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 what bothers you about the world? What's not right for you in terms of the way things are? And, and how do you wish things could be, right? And then, then what, what, what are the spaces and places and people who are taking action to deal with that, whether that's an organization or whether that's a movement or whether that, you know, there's so many different things that one can give. And, and the book is organized by chapters based on the different types of gifts that Madam Walker was giving. Mm. And it's interesting that only one is about money, right? That's very important. So philanthropy is much bigger than money. And so I try to highlight for people these other ways that you can give. And so those are things I think that people can take and think about your own background, you know, the, the, the problems with the world as you see it. And then how can you begin to take, take action in your part of the campus, in your part of the community? It doesn't have to be big or earth shattering, and you don't have to wait. You can give of yourself in some way that'll be meaningful and connect with these movements. And now with social media and others, it's, it's relatively easier um, uh, to make those kinds of connections and to become a part of networks uh, and to help in some way. Well, I think that might be a useful exercise for all of us to do, <laughs> not just yeah. students, but to really think about, you know, how did you get here? And, and my guess is all of us had, a, had some help or support from somebody um, to get where we are. So those, yeah. are, those are good things to talk about, because sometimes I think there's a tension between philanthropy and charity and, you know, handouts versus hand ups and all of that stuff. Like we're going to create some dependency um, if people receive gifts. Um, and I, I think we need to really think about that and upend that a little bit. Totally agree. I totally agree with that. Yes. So Dan Templin is on. He's our executive director of the Community Foundation here in DeKalb. Um, and he talks okay. about the five T's, <laughs> time, uh -huh. treasure, talent, testimony, and ties. Um, and I think we are expanding our notions of what a philanthropy is, but also who is a philanthropist and who gets to be a philanthropist. And do I want to take that on? Um, it, am I comfortable with that? Um, and this, this could be a generational thing. It could be a cultural thing. Like there's all kinds of different ways um, that we could express those things. But any thoughts on that as you, as you, uh, as Dan pointed out? Yeah. And in fact, th that, those are the, the leading questions that I see as defining my research agenda. What counts as philanthropy and who counts as a philanthropist? And yeah. um, that's really what pushed me into this study because again, I knew Mantle Marker, you know, gave and was engaged, but I wasn't seeing her anywhere. And that just, I didn't understand why, right? And, and so um, uh, that's, that's very important to, rec you know, recognize that this happens in many different places and spaces, and it doesn't belong to only one person. So um, absolutely, that, that's how I, you know, that's how I think about it. And we do need to change that face and recognize it's, it's, it's our collective human heritage. And though we might come to it or approach it in different ways, it's something that we share and can, and can embrace and, and, and deploy together uh, to deal with these issues. 
And do you see any um, in your work so far working with, you mentioned a couple of younger groups, student organizations and, and younger groups versus the, the older generations. Do you see them, um, are there some differences there that you would highlight in terms of their own giving, how they do it, but how they also view their philanthropy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. You know, you, if you look at the movement for Black Lives, right? They, um, they, 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 in many ways, they, 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 they pay respect to the civil rights generation, but they have problems with the way that generation did its work, and right. And so they think about leadership a little bit differently. Um, they like to be a little bit more horizontal and less kind of dependent upon one person, um, and that has benefits and it has challenges, right? It took a while for them to kind of coalesce, which is perhaps a, 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 a byproduct of that. Um, but now, you know, after years of kind of internal struggles, you know, they, they were ready for this moment, right? And they, they have agendas and they're moving them. And it's, it's really interesting that it's this, it's this decentralized movement that uh, in any city that the local chapter could be doing something very different, even though the media kind of gives it one single focus. Some, some, some BLM chapters are working on health and education. Right, and others are dealing with policing, and and that's so so it's really really interesting to see how this generation has come to the fight and is trying to set its own terms again based on their experiences and their knowledge, um, and so so I think those things are definitely there um, and important to pay attention to. You mentioned international. I think that's one of the challenges, maybe, or opportunities <laughs> um, for fundraisers is there's lots of competition for your philanthropic dollar, if we're just talking about money. Mm -hmm. And those organizations are now anywhere in the world, which was very different than years ago, yeah. where we didn't know about everything that was going on in the world. How do, how do domestic serving organizations sometimes, how do they compete on that stage? Because our, our interests now are so vast and really global. And I think that's a, it's definitely hard yeah. for fundraisers. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, we, we're, we're a global economy, right? We're more connected than ever, even as we deal with, you know, kind of excruciating isolation, right, and alienation. Um, it is important uh, to, to be grounded in your case for support. Um, and to be actively reaching out and trying to grow the base of people who are interested in what you're doing. And so that, that's where it's important for us to kind of overcome these barriers and overcome these myths. Um, because again, there, there are philanthropic and vibrant uh, cultures and communities of generosity right under our noses. We just haven't been paying attention to them. And, and the other thing I, I, I like to point out for people is, you know, it really is upon the field to get its act together. Because communities of color have been giving and they're not waiting right, right. For, for for fundraisers and nonprofit organizations to get it together and figure out that they should be soliciting they, they actively are asserting their own philanthropic agenda this right. they're going to be okay now they should be at the table right and and you know and, and there are issues where they need to be at the table and, and to keep pressing right but but uh, it's important to recognize this that I, I think the field needs to take this on and to own up to it and really um, aggressively take it on and try to reverse some of these barriers to engagement um, and, and see these donors and provide equal opportunity for engagement, as I've said. Um, it's important to recognize them. They've been giving from the beginning. They will continue to give, but they are constituents. They deserve attention and engagement just like any other constituent. And so that's where we have to question our own desire for, again, the equal opportunity and how we're treating people. Well, I think we, we run out of questions in the chat. You and I could probably keep chatting <laughs> for a long time. Keep going on and on and <laughs> Want to tell us about your next project before we, because this is just like, it'll be the Tyrone and Alicia show here, but um, do you want to oh, tell gosh. us what your next project is worth that you're working on? If, if you want to give us a sneak peek. No, he's not ready yet. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, I hesitate a little bit, you know. It's okay. Uh, no, um, um, I'll just say briefly to toward okay. that idea of curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had to engage a lot of different literatures to provide the context for what Madam Walker and her peers were doing. And so now I want to kind of harness the insights of those literatures and bring them together in accessible ways for nice. the field to engage them as it considers these larger questions yeah. of curriculum and how do we teach this work. So. Yeah, I think, you know, when, I, when I've been teaching the philanthropy and fundraising, I started teaching it nine years ago, maybe. Um, I teach it yeah. now very differently. And we're actually going to have one of our um, NIU Foundation staff members is going to teach it next spring. And so I'm excited, <laughs> a professional fundraiser teaching it um, versus myself. But it was also really challenging to pull materials together because there are lots of books on the history of American philanthropy 
and they're not very diverse, as you mentioned. So we lack the resources right. to, to teach a more inclusive history when it comes to philanthropy or fundraising, because they're written in a certain way where you know we're missing the boat. So I had to piecemeal a lot of that stuff together. So I look forward to right. whatever right. shape your, <laughs> your next project takes. <laughs> I look forward to it because we're teaching this stuff now. And I want to send our students out yeah. um, prepared and knowledgeable about this because this is not, they're going to bring this to their organizations. This isn't necessarily something that the organization right. is doing right now. And so I, I want to make sure that's that they're, right. they're equipped and knowledgeable when they go out. And, and you know, America's demographics are changing, right? And so we're going to need more people in the field um, to be reflective of what's actually going on out in the population. So um, it's, again, to, to all of your students, fundraising can be a wonderful field, a wonderful career. Um, and, and I encourage you to, to you know, look into it and, and take advantage of it. Thank you so much, Tyrone. It was amazing. We learned so much about Madam Walker. I can't wait to get the book. <laughs> um, it's, it's wonderful. The research is amazing. Bringing historical research, there's so little of it that's sometimes done in public administration mm -hmm. anyway. We sometimes don't appreciate it. We like these large end studies. So it's amazing mm -hmm. to see very in-depth qualitative research um, that will really support the field. So we'll do a, a virtual clap for... <laughs> Oh. For Dr. Freeman, I'm, I hope to see you. There's going to be the Arnova conference coming up in November. So hopefully um, we'll, you'll yes. be doing some presentations yes, there. <laughs> That'll be I amazing. Will. I will. That's awesome. Yes, and we have a couple this, panels there. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> I got to get my stuff together. We have one more. <laughs> I got one panel and I seem, whew, that's enough. <laughs> that's a lot. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, I but do, certainly I follow do. Dr. Freeman, get his book, um, see him the next time. Oh, you're going to you. be doing lots of book talks over the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. I can't wait to see you again in person so we can chit chat again, and we'd love to have you back. Thank oh, you thank so you. much, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank Go to everybody. our Eventbrite site, and you can sign up for future programs. We're happy to have you and watch for an email coming with the recording so you can share it broadly. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.